<laughs> yeah, I will, but he's going to be on screen first. Just from cool. Okay, good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Okay. Okay, so thank you very much uh, for being here. And my name is Carlos. I work for XM, which is the independent system operator. Uh, in the next minute, um, I'm going to talk about the variable renewable energy challenges in uh, the tr energy transition. Okay. Okay. We are going to start with the basic facts about our Colombian power system. Next, we are going to talk about uh, the actual the current situation in our country in terms of uh, power systems. And then we are going to finish with the challenges. Uh, for uh, analyze what's, uh, what's our roadmap for the next years. Colombia has a peak load of approximately 11 gigawatts and an annual consumption of 74 gigawatts, 74,000 gigawatts uh, per year. Um, it's a big country with uh, 50 million people. Uh, XM is the independent uh, operator. Uh, we have a few um, participants in the market with transmission companies, generation companies, almost 100 distribution companies and retailers uh, in our market. We have interconnections with Ecuador um, in 230 kilovolts and 138 uh, kilovolts level. Uh, as you can see in the map, uh, we are mainly um, a long system uh, from south to the north. Uh, in the middle, we have the big uh, uh, cities like uh, uh, capitals uh, and other cities. Uh, it's in the middle of the country. Uh, in the north of, of the country, the Caribbean, in the Caribbean Sea, we have uh, three major cities and also uh, in the south. Um, in the uh, pink color, you can see the transmission lines uh, uh, all over the country. Uh, in green color, we have the uh, red network in 230 kilovolts. In terms of uh, numbers of the installed capacity, Colombia is mainly idle with approximately 13 gigawatts. Uh, thermal is approximately six uh, gigawatts and a few amount of solar and other uh, new renewable uh, generators, a total of approximately 19 gigawatts. Um, Colombia is very vulnerable uh, to El Nino oscillation uh, phenomenon, uh, which impacts us with uh, dry events. And as we have uh, mainly hydro, um, our reservoirs are um, with uh, few uh, energy and uh, this is a, a very interesting situation to analyze in, in our system. Uh, our uh, peak demand is approximately um, 11 gigawatts uh, in the evening and mainly when we are in a usually a normal situation we have a generation of 80 hydro and 20 percent thermal. In those situations when we have dry seasons is 50-50 approximately. For the future, our system is going uh, to um, uh, increase the generation. Notice, especially in yellow color, the solar component is going to be huge. Um, we are going to have um, uh, in the 2032, approximately 36% uh, 
of uh, the generation with solar and approximately 7% wind. We are going to have uh, an installed capacity of 38 gigawatts by the year 2032. So the challenge, the challenge here for our power system is uh, to deal with variable renewable resources, which is going to be approximately 17 gigawatts. In XM, what we are thinking, we're um, planning is to, uh, to be prepared for the operation on the market. As you can see, we have four main focus, starting by the energy sufficiency, power flexibility, transmission capacity, and security. In terms of power flexibility and energy sufficiency, uh, we have, um, uh, let's say, a division in terms of the time. Um, for flexibility, we are thinking about seconds and minutes in energy sufficiency in terms of days and years. For transmission and security, we have something uh, between seconds and days. And we have something, a process transversal for all the company of the processes, which is the technology and cybersecurity. Going a, a little bit with details, um, respecting impact in terms of security, respecting uh, reduced levels of inertia. We have analyzed from the planning studies that uh, 300 megawatt contingency may, may cause uh, uh, the uh, lot shedding skin to to be operating. We are going to, to have a higher uh, rate of change of frequency. In terms of strength, we are going to have deeper sucks in terms of voltage. We are going to have uh, increased spread of voltage sucks in the grid. Um, we are um, facing a, a phenomena which is called the fault induced delay voltage recovery. And uh, um, also the some and N minus one may cause the activation of the load shedding scheme. Uh, also, the reduce we are going to, to be impacted by uh, less uh, reduced levels of reserve or primary reserve. Um, in terms of uh, the voltage in the area, now we have uh, in, in, in the graphic in you right in green colors. Uh, this is. Uh, the result of some studies in, in terms of uh, voltage analysis. And now we are facing some spread of the voltage in some uh, substations, but uh, in the uh, future years, we're going to have uh, 40, uh, 84% of renewables, not conventionals like solar and wind. And we are going to have um, a very interesting uh, uh, spread of the voltage and the levels of the uh, uh, short circuit is going to be definitely changed. In terms of transmission, all these renewable uh, we are talking about solar and wind is going to be in the north part of the country, which is in the Caribbean. In the Colombian map uh, I showed, this was in the north. Uh, we are going to have uh, uh, some uh, energy uh, export uh, limits. We are going to have uh, uh, some congestions to evacuate all this energy from the north uh, to the main uh, system in the inner part of, of, of Colombia. In the event of a decrease in the capacity of these transmission lines to the eastern and southwestern regions due to in, uh, problems in the availability of, of, of the projects uh, in, in terms of transmission, we are going to have uh, some difficulties to evacuate all this this uh, energy. Uh, the planning studies in the middle shows uh, that having uh, hydrologies uh, with high, medium, and low scenarios, we are going to have um, uh, some interchange. Um, what uh, they are shown with colors um, in the middle of the graphic, and we uh, have made all these studies with the methodology of uh, uh, flexibility studies, uh, having thousands of uh, studies and scenarios to have these results. Mm. Um, in terms of flexibility, 
wind and solar curtailments in condition of low net demand. When we have less than uh, 4,000 uh, megawatts, uh, it's uh, recommended to, to advance in the flexibility of the available thermal and hydraulic park due to these um, changes in the uh, wind and, and solar. Uh, new regulatory and technological elements of operational coordination uh, is going to be required to maintain the balance uh, between loads and uh, generation. Definitely unit commitment with less granularity and closer to real time is an important issue for our system. Shorter operational coordination times is also is going to be very uh, important for our system. And in terms of regulation, we need incentives for demand and generation uh, to be uh, adjust to the original uh, expectations. Uh, in terms of observability, we also see that it's important to have from SCADA on all other uh, technological issues we have to, to, to improve their observability. Uh, energy sufficiency is also an issue uh, analyzed in simulations to 2027. Um, it's necessary to analyze this because the demands is what we are analyzing is it should be fully met. Um, a reliable behavior is found in the system hydraulic reserves. Um, it is observed that in times of uh, shortage of solar, wind, or water resources, the thermal park responds uh, to the needs uh, and uh, with reliability and security in the system. We need to improve uh, a system for measuring, analyzing all the uh, predicting uh, variables um, just to, to be alert uh, what's going to to, to have in, in, in our system. Um, in the left, we, we have um, our demand uh, in terms of hours and how uh, we um, balance uh, the generation to this uh, demand. Um, we have all the studies about the evolutions of the reservoirs for the next years. Um, <coughs> In terms of technology and cybersecurity, it's also a, an issue very important. Um, we think that plays a critical role uh, to have a successful energy uh, transition. Um, and uh, the market is also an issue. Our regulatory body, which is called CREC in Colombia, has been conducting studies to develop rules about binding dispatch in today's market the wholesale electricity market. And uh, also it's necessary to improve our ancillary services and uh, consider the co-optimization uh, in the energy market. In 2022, uh, they are made a proposal for new uh, regulation. Um, now uh, we would appreciate the next speakers just to uh, consider into account our um, situation and the gaps we have to be closed. Thank you. Gracias. Buenos días. This is Guillermo from the California ISO. Eh, voy a atreverme a hacer la presentación en español eh, ahora que estamos aquí en Colombia. Gracias, Ale, por la invitación a XM, a USA, EA. Es un placer volver a estar aquí en Medellín. Y gracias a Carlos por la introducción del sistema colombiano, porque es, creo, una de las áreas más importantes en términos de poner el contexto de la plática. Cada sistema tiene sus condiciones inherentes a la geografía, a la ubicación, a las condiciones políticas incluso. Entonces es importante que a través de esas discusiones se tenga en mente ese contexto del sistema en particular del que se está tratando. Cuando hablamos del sistema de California, obviamente tiene algunas características inherentes a la eh, posición geográfica, política. Eh, muchos de ustedes pueden saber que California ha estado en el, en el, al frente de esta, de esta transición energética. Hemos estado por más de 10 años en este, en este movimiento hacia una decarbonización del sistema eléctrico. Y obviamente esto ha eh, expuesto varios retos tecnológicos, eh, de políticas, de cómo hacer posible esta transición energética. Y obviamente tiene que ver en el contexto no solamente geográfico, cómo estamos ubicados y cómo estamos impactados por las condiciones meteorológicas, 
pero también por las políticas energéticas. Eh, California se ha caracterizado por ser un estado eh, altamente eh, involucrado en el aspecto del medio ambiente y muchas de las políticas energéticas reflejan esa, esa necesidad. Eh, ha puesto, por ejemplo, estos eh, objetivos de, de carbonizar el sistema eléctrico a un 100% para el 2045 o algo así, y es uno de, las, de, los, de, la, de los motivos por el cual el sistema se ha tenido que estar adaptando a las condiciones de, de introducir estos nuevos eh, elementos tecnológicos de, de energías renovables. Ahora, en términos de, del contexto de esta plática, hay muchos temas que absorber en, en el contexto de los retos. Podría especificar que cualquier área que se maneje en el sistema de, del sistema de California representa un reto en cierta forma porque es, eh, al final de cuentas, el objetivo de adaptarse a esos retos. Entonces, eh, la presentación que tengo aquí es muy puntual en, en ciertos términos de cuáles son los retos muy específicos que tenemos en el sistema y tiene que ver ampliamente con la integración de las energías renovables. El primer reto tiene que ver con la integración de energías renovables con la variabilidad. Eh, obviamente las energías convencionales poseen mínima variabilidad porque tenemos el combustible, sabemos que pueden operar, pueden seguir las instrucciones. Las energías renovables, por otro lado, son inherentemente variables, están sujetas a las condiciones ambientales, a la temperatura, a las, eh, a las nubes. Entonces, operar un sistema con una penetración alta de energías renovables implica tener que lidiar con la variabilidad del sistema. Esta gráfica, por ejemplo, en la derecha, representa las proyecciones que teníamos de un pronóstico de generación solar a medida que estábamos en ciertos tiempos de, del mercado, un día en adelanto, una hora en adelanto, 15 minutos en adelanto y en tiempo real. A medida que uno avanza más hacia el tiempo real, se puede ver que la, la, la energía solar está variando de hecho, estamos perdiendo esa energía solar. Cuando empezamos con el mercado de adelanto, que es el, el pronóstico más, más lejano que tenemos en 24 horas, es la tendencia en azul. Estamos proyectando que teníamos aproximadamente 4.000 megawatts de energía solar. Al momento en que llegamos al tiempo real, que es prácticamente balance de 5 minutos, efectivamente el pronóstico, la generación era aproximadamente la mitad, 2.000 megawatts. Y eso, este es un... Es una condición muy típica de las energías renovables en ciertos periodos de, del año. Por ejemplo, en los periodos de, de transición del, del invierno a la primavera o del verano, o del verano hacia, hacia el invierno. Y obviamente se tiene que planear el sistema de tal forma que podamos absorber esa variabilidad. Si estamos proyectando tener 4.000 MW de energía solar en el mercado de adelanto y, y repentinamente perdemos la mitad de eso a medida que vamos al tiempo real, ¿cómo podemos planear la operación del sistema de tal forma que el sistema pueda absorber esa variabilidad. Ahora, 4.000 MW no es la capacidad que tenemos en el sistema. Tenemos aproximadamente 17.000 MW de, de energía solar actualmente. Pero estos cambios tan drásticos tienen que ver con la ubicación geográfica que tenemos. Eh, obviamente es un sistema eh, radial que enfrenta a estas condiciones eh, cambiantes todo o nada. Si hay una nube, prácticamente cubre toda la energía solar se tiene esas pérdidas muy dramáticas. Otra, otra área de, de retos tiene que ver con todas las nuevas tecnologías, ya sea de demanda o de, o de suministro, que pasan detrás del medidor. Manejamos el sistema a nivel de, de transmisión al mercado mayorista, pero mucha integración de estas energías tiene que ver ahora detrás del medidor, a nivel de distribución. California, por ejemplo, es muy agresivo en lo que son los techos solares. Tenemos aproximadamente 11.000 MW de energía detrás del medidor en los techos solares. Esto se va a incrementar hasta 19.000 MW para el 2030. Y al final de cuentas, es de, eh, suministro que va a impactar el sistema, no directamente como una energía convencional, sino va a impactarlo de una forma que disminuye la demanda que el sistema mayorista tiene que suministrar. Y posee ciertos retos porque al momento en que está detrás del medidor, perdemos la visibilidad. No tenemos exactamente conocimiento de cómo va a estar operando en los próximos minutos, qué capacidad está en, ca en cada parte del sistema 
Y es un reto, porque al final de cuentas tenemos que balancear la demanda del sistema y esa demanda está altamente influenciada por esta capacidad que está detrás del medidor. Otro reto tiene que ver con la thousand megawatts far from the current operating uh, point how can we operate the market when we know that variable that that variability is there even behind the meter and it has to do with uh, the capabilities that we have for a right demand of forecast it is class it is typical to know that as we uh, go away from the real uh, time environmental conditions have a greater influence on the uh, forecast. When we go closer to the real-time operation, we go from environmental conditions to a more persistent model. If it was sunny five minutes ago, it is we can assume that the, five, the next five minutes is going to continue with the same uh, conditions. So it is important to have uh, the tools, the methodologies that will allow us to move throughout this uh, periods of time so that we can maximize the uh, gain of each one of the tools that we have depending on where in time we're forecasting that demand. But we had some challenges that even if we have a very accurate a model for forecast supply, the challenge is how fast can we absorb that in the system? For example, given the configuration that we have in our system, once we get the demand forecast, it can take from 15 to 20 minutes for that model, for that demand to be absorbed in the market. 20 minutes in terms of system ramps is a long time. It is a long time of delay to absorb that uh, updated information. We can talk about 20 minutes in the afternoon ramp. And for example, that represents 5,000, 10,000 megawatts. And it is not about the quality of the forecast. It is how fast we can include that forecast in the market processes. Another challenge has to do, of course, with how we can transition in the system operation and Clive's going to talk a little bit about this in more detail, but the challenge is to adapt the operation, the processes we have to handle the system operation. We have new products in the market. We have new products of reliability that we need to supply. We have a variety of protocols that we need to adjust, for example, years ago when the integration of renewable energies was minimum and the objective of uh, getting a regulation in the system was minimum 300 megawatts flat all day long then as we get more integration of more renewable energies those regulation objectives have changed now they depend on the prior the weather forecast that we have you can see that we have uh, some behaviors throughout the year it can be as uh, low as 300 or as high as 1500 because we're internalizing the environmental conditions in determining how much regulation we need in the system we have different uh, suppliers of demand uh, uh, forecast and production behind the meter and it is an art just to determine which of the uh, services is going to be uh, better for the conditions uh, that we have in that specific point in time throughout the day. We have some correct market characteristics that help us do some uh, forecast for of the ramps for up to five hours ahead. 
and that of course poses uh, technological challenges because the market needs to have that technological capacity to solve not just in the next five minutes but for the next four hours to have a solution for that and then are there are some other areas that we also need to implement in such a way that we have visibility of what's happening in the system <clears throat> a philosophy that uh, the California operator has followed from the beginning of the 2000s has to do with operating the, the system through the market. Everything we do is through the market so that the system operation is minimum in real time and out of the market. It also has to do with a philosophy and this based on the economy on the electric markets and we have invested for the last 14 years we have put a lot of effort not just in technology but also in developing the market in the design of that market to have the instruments and the mechanisms that will allow us to uh, allow us to operate the system to an electric market in an efficient manner one of the pillars that we have one of our fundamental pieces is that the market is agnostic technology wise regardless of it being battery solar or gas we always try to have a structure that treats all technologies the same way as we evolve the market of course it's become more complex we have different products besides energy we have reliability services now we have a new product that is about variability of ramps and these products interact in such a way that they can be really complex to understand what's happening. One of the uh, p fundamental pillars when it comes to time to have a market like a tool to operate the system has to do with making sure that certainty and transparency is supplied to the market participants for them to know and understand why such instructions are in such a way, why the uh, cost, the prices are originated in such a way uh, so that they can participate in an efficient manner in the, into the market. One of the uh, most challenges has to do with how to evolve the market and how to design it to uh, create the right incentives. Our philosophy is that we need to have a market design that creates the uh, financial incentives for participants if the incentives are there we can expect optimal participation of the participants so it is typical for example you send a dispatch a signal to a generation resource the expectation for them to uh for us is to, for them to follow that to increase is 100 from 100 to 200 the expectation is for them to follow that instruction but if the prices they are faced with are not uh, generating that incentive to follow the instruction then we have a perverse incentive because we need to make sure that due to reliability that instruction them to be paid for the services they are supplying if that resource has to be not only dispatched but they have to increase the volume there has to in their computers they need to have a product that will give an incentive that can supply that service and it also has to do with payments and the cost the generator is going to face the new trend of technologies has to do with expanding those technologies at the distribution level and in the end uh, the impact can be seen through the demand in the system how can we internalize the incentives of those resources when we don't have visibility or controllability of those resources so through the marketplaces and prices, those resources may have the right signal to operate in an efficient manner. Now, the last part has to do with uh, incentives, market incentives, when there is high penetration of renewables. A uh, result of that is cost zero. What is the marginal cost of operating a solar plant or a wind plant? Through marginal costs, it is about zero costs. 
how can a market evolve when the trend of this marginal cost is to a zero cost is new areas all the operators are handling what is the market design needed to create the economic incentives through this new um, margin, co zero co marginal cost structure. The last part has to do with technology. You can have the expectation of developing the design, create economic incentives, but the way to implement that is through these uh, technological infrastructures just by designing a system that will allow us to absorb all the information needed every five minutes, have the capacity, the computer capacity to generate prices through a system more than 10,000 nodes and handle hundreds of uh, reliability and security restrictions that have to do with uh, technology. Invest in technology in a way that it is possible to implement all these market challenges and reliability of new products. In the end, that is going to be um, subject to the technology that will allow us to implement those challenges. And the integration of these renewable energies is going to is going to call for no solutions and it also poses no challenges and it is a logic uh, that is changing as we integrate new technologies for example just to close my talk just up to a few years ago a big challenge was that we had excess of solar and then uh, at noon we had to reduce that from clean energy because it was too much up to a year ago, that challenge has been minimal because now we have the integration of storage. This new technology is a component, it's a natural supplementary solution. Now, instead of uh, reducing renewables, we have uh, sand as storage energies midday. And now we have to we have that capacity to absorb the peaks in the after. So my conclusion, it is a technological challenge of new structures and new policies of understanding integration of these renewables, but they also have solutions. So my uh, advertisement here in this presentation would be, look at this not just as a challenge, but also as an opportunity to integrate new energies. Some technologies have fascinating solutions, for example, storage. They are the ideal technology to offer reliability services in regu regulation wise, because they can follow the instructions in a very um, accurate manner. Conventional energies do not have that because they don't have the capacity to follow in such an accurate manner. A technological challenge is that as these storage energies supply regulation, conventional energies have to follow the same dynamics. If storage energies quickly respond upwards, for example, they need the convention, conventional energies need to move upwards. So a way to generate the system that will take the accounts and characteristics into account of all the technologies in the system. That's all I have to tell you for this part. Later on, I, will, I think we're going to get into a talk and thank you for giving me this opportunity. Hi, everyone. We will be continuing on in a moment with Clyde Loughton from Kaiso. Thank you.
One note also, we're working on the English translation. I know the audio is very quiet. Um, so we're working on that. Clyde will be presenting in English, so at least for this, it'll be okay. Um, but the next presentation, if we do switch back to Spanish, we'll be solving that issue. Thank you. Clyde, it's all yours. Yeah. Buenos dias. So I'm going to be talking about the operational challenges. The actually challenges the system operators see in real time. Okay, so moving straight into operational challenges, what it is that we see in real time? So intra our rounds today is pretty huge for us. It's anywhere between plus or minus 7,000 megawatts in some hours. And that's a lot of megawatts to move within an hour. The, the three hour ramps, especially during the evening hour sunset, when the solar is dropping off, we need to ramp up in excess of 17,000 megawatts uh, today. And that's a lot of, again, a lot of megawatts to move. <clears throat> the 10 minute variability that we see on the system, this is a combination of uh, load wind solar, uh, um, load is pretty variable also, and behind the meter rooftop PV. It could be anywhere from a thousand, plus or minus a thousand to 1500 uh, megawatts. And this is in 10 minutes. Uh, uh, so um, when we operate the market, as grandma talked about, by the time we make decisions to move units, we could be off by about plus or minus 1500 uh, megawatts, 1 1.5 gigawatts. So we have seen the intra five minute time frame where we need regulation to balance the system. In some hours that's running out. Um, oversight, oversupply conditions, we see a lot of that today, especially on weekends. Um, but a month ago we had to curtail a little over 9,000 megawatts, nine gigawatts, because we had oversupply conditions um, on the system. Uh, middle of the day is a challenge that we're trying to figure out how it is we need to um, address that. Control performance issues, this is how well we balance supply and demand in real time. We tend to see a lot of challenges during sunrise, sunset, and during the middle of the day. Uh, during the spring months, it's a challenge because you have a lot of renewables, a lot of hydro, and committing enough gas units to provide primary frequency control, frequency response is a challenge on the system. Um, on this plot here, this is looking on the left. You can see some of the challenges we see. And this is looking at March last year, seven consecutive days. You can see how different that is from one day to the next. This creates a lot of challenges for forecasters. How do you forecast one day to the next? You know, and this, this here is net load, load minus wind, minus solar. And you can see how uh, very uh, variable that is. So the forecasters need to make sure they can forecast with some level of accuracy so that we could commit the correct units with the right flexibility to meet that peak demand um, on any given day. On the right, this is the 10 minutes variability that you see. 95% is the blue shaded area there, and that's a lot of megawatts. Again, variability within a 10 minute time period. And again, this here is after the system, after you dispatch regulation service. So the true variability is you could add anywhere between 500 megawatts to 1,000 megawatts in some of these hours to see the true variability on the system. Um, this is looking at less than a month ago, April 23rd this year. Uh, we served 108% of the energy needs within the California ISO. and We were able to export you know, roughly 8%. Uh, so we know meeting the, the energy goals is doable. The thing is the challenges that we see, if you look at the, the amount of solar, the amount of wind we have on the system there, it's quite a bit. So the challenges we see, if you look between sunrise and sunset, it's if the wind kicks up or the solar kicks up, you have nothing to really back down because the, um, at the very bottom there is two nuclear plants and you've got things like geothermal, biomass, biogas, run under river hydro, that's pretty much baseloaded. 
And if you look at that red dotted line, it sits right on uh, your non-dispatchable generation. That's a big challenge that, that, that we have. And on the left, if you look at that red uh, bullet that we got there, we need renewables, inverter-based resources, including um, storage to provide essential grid services. When I say essential grid services, things like voltage control, frequency control, and the ability to run or accept a signal from the system operator and move. At uh, the very top, um, I don't know if you can see this, at the very top, yeah, right here, this is the amount of solar that is not solar, uh, storage that we got in the system. We tend to operate that right when the solar is dropping off currently. When we peaked in September uh, last year, we utilized storage for about eight hours right around this ramp. So the, the need for storage greater than four hours, we started to see that. What we had to do uh, during this day is we had to actually charge storage right around here so that we'd be able to use that storage in this time frame right here. So, so the need for eight hour storage is there, we started to see it. And if you look at some of the, the operational challenges in multiple operating days, this is pretty interesting here. On this part, again, just as in January, for four consecutive days, we had very little wind very little solar, and we relied a lot on the interchange. We relied a lot on the interchange, which is this green area right here, and this is your thermal uh, generation, not a lot of hydro, but it, when, you, when you operate with conditions like this, you gotta think about, well, without that thermal fleet, what am I gonna do, right? So we, again, here, yeah, this is the need for long-term storage is there, Currently in California, we're looking at the Energy Commission is looking at uh, projects right now to determine the amount of long-term storage. Can you stack four-hour storage to meet things like multi-day um, production when, when it's very, very little? Uh, so the, the key is how many long-term uh, storage capacity we need on the grid to operate a reliable grid. And when you look at the right, the right is, uh, just the opposite. You have a lot of wind. You have a lot of solar, which is which is this green. A lot of um, yellow here is solar. Not a lot of interchange in certain hours, right? But we have a lot of hydro, and then you back the thermal fleet way back down. Now this also creates challenges for us, especially hydro. If you have a lot of hydro under hydro spill conditions you get zero ancillary services from uh, the hydro fleet because they tend to operate pretty close to Pmax. When you operate pretty close to Pmax, they would not back off to provide downward um, ancillary services. And likewise, they have nothing to move up. So this is a challenge, especially, you know, I know you guys have uh, roughly 12,000 megawatts of hydro, but the question is, you know, if you have a really good hydro year, can you get the ancillary services, you know, from the hydro fleet? Um, so currently you do need the thermal fleet that you have. That transition is gonna be um, pretty interesting. And we, we gotta figure out right now, um, how much, again, how much storage capacity you need to fill that gap when, when you have um, periods with very low solar, very low, um, low uh, wind production. Now, this again is showing you what it is we need. What is the duck really telling us, right? It's telling us a few things. As we integrate higher and higher renewables on the system, it's very difficult to balance the system in the middle of the day. The middle of the day um, control, again, control performance uh, issues is a, a great challenge that we have out west. Um, as Guerra mentioned, we balance the system for a market every five minutes you know, to ensure you get the cheapest generation to meet load across a five minute time period. But the intra five minute, we balance the system every four seconds. And that's a, a challenge in, in the US or throughout the whole of North America, we get benchmark as to how well we balance the plant amount every minute. So it be, it, it's a little more challenging for us in the US to, to integrate high and higher levels of renewables only because we have strict control performance standards. 
right? And when I say strict, we got four that we need to comply with. If you fail one of those, they can come with a million dollars in fine per event. So um, it, it's pretty challenging. Um, managing oversupply, again, you know, it's a challenge. And when you look at this plot right here, that red area is something we try to minimize. Can we export a lot more uh, energy in lieu of curtailing uh, renewables? You know, we're looking for ways how to do that. Um, here on that uh, fourth bullet there, we're looking at solutions. Solutions are storage, time of use rate, right? Can we incentivize customers to do everything they need in using electricity by uh, imposing a really cheap uh, time of use rate when you have oversupply conditions? is something that we, we uh, introduced to the California Public Utilities Commission. It's not implemented yet, but that's one way to shape and shift demand. The, the idea being is you wanna go from a sitting dock right here to a, a flatter dock, you know, to make the system a little more uh, healthy and easy to operate. Um, Right here, again, you know, it's important to maintain sufficient capacity when you have periods or uh, consecutive days with a very low wind, very low uh, solar production, uh, how much that capacity is, is key. When, when folks, especially, you know, um, policymakers look at the ability to serve 108% of your energy needs, plus you can export with non-carbon resources. First thing that comes to mind is, well, we could get rid of, uh, the, the gas fleet. Well, no, you cannot. Um, well, one of the biggest challenges we see right now is this second or last bullet is during sunrise. For six months of the year, the load is pretty flat and you got about anywhere from five to 8,000 megawatts of solar coming down to the grid. You tend to see oversupply, high frequency, high area control error. How it is you gonna control that? So that's a huge challenge for us right now. We tend to see consecutive hours where it's very, very difficult to control the grid, only because you do not have the load to meet that increased uh, solar production. And on top of that, you have, well, we got currently anywhere from actual production, 10,000 to um, a little over 11,000 megawatts of actual behind the meter uh, production. You have no visibility, no controllability on that, and the offset load, right? So even though you have a good forecast, the ability for the system operator to balance the system on a four second basis and then get benchmark as to how well they can control that grid every minute, it's, it's a huge uh, challenge for us. So we're looking at ways right now, uh, during sunrise is a place where storage can um, you know, really help uh, balancing uh, the grid. And this last bullet here is really important for us, right? We need um, renewable re resources, any kind of inverter-based resources, wind, solar, um, storage, to be able to follow dispatch instructions from uh, the system operators. Um, sometimes, you know, folks think being able to move fast is good, but sometimes being able to move fast is not good. Currently, we're looking at a few things on the grid to slow the response from especially solar. Solar could move very, very fast. It can move in cycles. But remember, you got conventional units on any fleet and you, and you got to you know, judiciously balance that supply and demand. So we're trying to, to impose a limit on solar resources and that limit's gonna be anywhere from what? Um, P max minus P min divided by five. So uh, we wanna be able to uh, move from PMIN to PMAX within five minutes to help reduce the, the um, instant impact that you see with um, any kind of inverter-based resources. They can move so quick. And if in five minutes you respond, if, if we call, let's say for a thousand megawatts and you can provide a thousand megawatts in one minute, it really impacts the control performance for the next four minutes if you operate in a five minute market. So these are some of the things you know we're looking at uh, controllability is, is key. And my, my last point here is even on rooftop PV is three things you wanna ask rooftop PV to provide now. Again, voltage control, frequency control, and the ability to run because we have no controllability. 
One of the things we did in California is we imposed, um, uh, it's called Rule 21, you can see that on the internet. Uh, what that really means is if the system frequency is high, because the rooftop PV impacts grid, the, the frequency as is similar to the grid um, in one of its resources. So if the system frequency is high, the new rooftop PV that's going in, they automatically need to back off. The system voltage is high, they automatically need uh, to back off to help the grid control um, or to help the operators control uh, the grid. With that, you know, I pause there and introduce, I think Mike's up next. Thank you, everybody. I'm just going to mute this real quick. All right, so we're back here. Um, I'm going to just want to hand it off to Mike DeSocio from New York ISO. Um, Mike, are you with us here? I sure am. Great, so we can hear you in the, in the room here. I'm gonna mute myself and you should be good to share your screen. Um, I'll be on the chat. So if you have any questions from the audience, please put them in the, the Q&A section um, from our previous speakers or for Mike as well, and we can uh, deal with that. I know we're running a little behind, but I appreciate everyone sticking with us. Um, it's, it's really great to hear from everybody. So Mike, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. And you can see my screen okay? Yeah, we can see your screen on Zoom and on uh, in person here. Perfect. Perfect. Uh, so good day. It's a pleasure to be here today. I'm going to walk through a little bit of what New York's been up to, and we'll start with sharing a little bit of background about who we are. The New York ISO has, uh, has a mission to make sure we keep the lights on and do so with competitive wholesale markets that supports New York's vision to be uh, to a clean energy future. And uh, we do work very closely with our stakeholders on all the challenges and opportunities that we face on a day to day and year-to-year -year basis. A little bit about us, uh, the company is roughly 600 people. New York uh, back in 21 had roughly 20 million folks. Uh, many of them are in Southeast New York. We operate roughly 11,000 circuit miles of transmission. And uh, we are now starting to get involved in distribution, which uh, there's roughly another 110,000 miles of, of distribution. Uh, Back in 21, we, we served 151 gigawatt hours for the year. So just a little bit about, about us. Our focus is uh, really working to be ready to comply with uh, New York's ambitious clean energy goals. Uh, those goals are shaped in several facets. Uh, the first is 70% renewable energy to serve electric load in New York uh, by 2030. Then after that, they're looking at a completely clean electric system by 2040 and uh, looking to clean other sectors by 2050. And then to do that, they have uh, certain stated goals regarding how much solar, how much uh, storage. Uh, we now have a 6,000 megawatt or six gigawatt storage goal by 2030 and an offshore winds goal uh, of 9,000 or 9 gigawatts by uh, 2035. So our challenges, uh, as you've heard, and I think many of you have uh, been, been thinking about, have to do with balancing across different timescales. Uh, in New York, we, we are not as solar rich as other parts of the United States, like California. And so we are going to depend much more heavily on wind, in particular offshore wind, to help us achieve these clean energy targets. And so that does present some, some challenges for us, uh, particularly the diurnal challenge or the daily challenge that uh, you heard uh, Clyde, uh, Clyde talk about. That's certainly a challenge that we're gonna face. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about that and what we're doing for it. But then we also have uh, challenges where we expect to have uh, lulls across longer periods of time potentially shoulder periods of the year 
where we have low wind production and solar uh, availability is um, is not helpful during the times of peak hour. So, uh, so certainly those are the challenges we're facing. A little bit about where we are. We are early in our transition. So these goals are in place and procurements are taking place, but we have not uh, developed large quantities of these assets on the grid just yet. Uh, we see a change in the comp, uh, what makes up the market over the next 15 or 16 years to be almost a tripling of the amount of capacity we're going to have to deal with. And in doing so, we're also looking at electrification goals, which means the amount of energy consumption is also going to go up. A little bit about our topology. Uh, New York has traditionally had a lot of large generation in the north and uh, western parts of the state where we are hydro rich or uh, have lots of water cooling capability off of Lake Ontario. And so we've got lots of uh, capability there. And most of the load is in uh, the New York City area and Long Island area, which is down in this, uh, this Southeast New York area where it says transmission need for offshore wind. So that means we need to be able to connect uh, new resources to where, where the energy consumption is going to take place. And we have been hard at work at uh, facilitating new transmission or transmission expansion. There are four main things happening here. Uh, we had bottling of our largest hydro facility, Niagara Falls, in the West. And so we had a public policy transmission need that was uh, recently put into service in 2022, which has unbottled that hydro. We have lots of wind up north where the blue lines are and uh, a need to deliver that wind into central New York so we can get it to New York City. And then we have a lot of bottling between the northwest and southeast parts of New York, which led to AC transmission public policy, which is the yellow in the middle of the state. And more recently, we are working on uh, getting ahead of the curve with respect to integrating offshore wind. Uh, we are expecting uh, at least nine gigawatts, but I, our projections are projecting, we're projecting closer to 20 gigawatts of offshore winds, which we will need, need to integrate into the rest of the system. And that means we need to reinforce the transmission system that connects Long Island to the rest of New York through the Long Island public policy transmission need. A lot of these uh, transmission efforts are uh, declarative from, um, from the New York State regulator, they are declaring that there is a public policy need to expand the transmission system, of which then the New York ISO has a process to facilitate uh, merchant investors' proposals, investigate those, and, and um, pick the most economic and practical uh, transmission expansion capability. Uh, and then lastly, we've got lots of offshore winds under contract, but not yet being built. We are seeing some of the constraints, some of the supply, con uh, supply chain constraints uh, happening here in New York, and that has delayed some of the, uh, the build of offshore wind. These, uh, these facilities have been contracted by the state. The state has uh, an entity called NYSERDA, who acts as a central buyer for these renewable resources. And the way they do that is they, they issue uh, renewable energy credits. Uh, so those credit, those contracts are voluntary. That means the, uh, the state is willing to guarantee uh, payment if energy is produced, but at any particular time, if things don't work out, uh, the merchant can walk away. So a little bit about the background of what we're dealing with. And so how do we, how do we make sure we're prepared for this? We, uh, we've been thinking a lot about our reliability challenges and really that gets into making sure we can comply with all of the reliability standards that are set forth by uh, the regulatory councils and companies that New York ISO uh, needs to comply with. That, those entities include 
the uh, Northeast Reliability Council, the uh, Northeast Power Coordinating uh, Company, the uh, and then and then New York has its own New York State Reliability Council. So all those entities are really thinking hard about uh, whether the reliability rules we have today are stringent enough. Do they uh, do they accommodate the new challenges that we're going to be facing as we add more um, inverter-based resources on the grid, as we add uh, and change the makeup of what is base load resources versus variable resources. So all of that uh, is something that we're very interested in. And as we think about and study these issues, we are facing challenges in several different time horizons, as I mentioned earlier. So we're thinking about balancing supply and demand uh, and meeting resource adequacy needs. Uh, those two things can be coupled. And as we couple them, we're thinking more about, do we have enough resources to support all sorts of uh, grid operations, whether that be uh, blue sky events or extreme weather events? Uh, and so there's a lot of work happening in making sure our models are capturing more of these extreme conditions, whether that be temperature, that be um, other system constraints like lack of natural gas or uh, and or uh, changes to how consumers are consuming electricity uh, as they are moving away from fossil based uh, appliances to electric based appliances for heating, water, uh, all of those things. There's a lot of things for us. There's a lot of challenges that we need to deal with. And so what we've done is we have started to catalog these issues and highlight opportunities for us to get in front of some of some of the concerns. Uh, one example of this is uh, thinking about system strength. When, when New York is uh, working to integrate all of this transmission on this map, one, one, and we are adding lots of intermittent resources, uh, those intermittent resources are inverter-based, and we are starting to see issues with uh, not enough fault current. Uh, that leads to system strength issues, and so now we are focused on uh, more passive types of devices uh, like synchronous condensers to help us manage some of those uh, soft spots. Uh, and so those are some of the some of the things that we're doing. We end up now reassessing the reliability of the grid every every quarter. We run a quarterly an, an assessment to make sure that we are getting and collecting the most up-to-date information about the state of the system and the in-service dates of all the new resources. And what we're finding right now is we're looking at a capacity shortfall for New York City that uh, will be here as quickly as the, as, uh, the summer of 2025. Uh, and that has to do not with, uh, not with the lack of existing fleet, but uh, forced retirements due to emissions restrictions that and the delay in getting some of the new clean resources on the system. As far as uh, working with stakeholders and policymakers about making sure we're providing the right signals that Guillermo talked about earlier and dealing with some of the, uh, the attribute issues that Clyde also mentioned, we have uh, three-faceted approach. First is making sure the markets are ready and capable of supporting all the new technologies coming at us. That's on the far left-hand side. In the middle is more about making sure we have the right market approaches to balancing the grid on a minute-to-minute, hour-by-hour, day-to-day basis. And that really has to do with bolstering our energy and ancillary service product designs, making sure we are um, more dynamic in, in determining how much reserves we need to carry and where. Uh, we are more, uh, we are thinking a little bit more about sustainability needs. Uh, right now, our reserve products are have a sustainability requirement of an hour, and we don't think that's long enough as we start to integrate more solar, wind, and uh, behind the meter resources. 
we think uh, sustainability requirements probably need to grow into the four plus hour range. And so those are things that we're, we're currently working through with our stakeholders. And then lastly, we need to make sure we have enough resources to be available when, uh, when the new fleet is not available, right? We expect as we add more offshore wind, more solar, more land-based winds, there are gonna be times of the year, times of, uh, of critical seasons where those resources may not be available. That might be because of extreme weather conditions like a hurricane, or that might be because of um, of just naturally in the in the winter time we we have lots of cloud cover in New York, so solar is not as prevalent. We also have snow, so the solar panels are covered by snow, and so in those cases, do we have enough enough other resources to serve the load? Uh, and that really what that gets at is making sure we're properly accounting for the reliability contribution these resources provide to meeting our one in 10 resource adequacy criteria. And then lastly, um, what I would mention is we, we recognize that we are very dependent on fossil-based resources to deal with balancing today. And there is a large opportunity for us to increase the flexibility of the grid by enabling uh, the demand side and so we have been very focused on making sure we provide opportunities there in the wholesale market so that we can unlock some of that, that capability, which will help us balance, at least on a daily basis, the grid um, as these constraints start to occur and they move around the system. So uh, just another tool for the operators to, to leverage as we, uh, as we deal with the, the energy transition. Lots to uh, lots to think about, and looking forward to more conversations with you all. Thank you. Well, thanks, Mike. Uh, we appreciate you having those comments, especially from NISO. It's like it's really nice to hear from you uh, on that. Let me see if there's a question. I, don't, I know we have some uh, time constraints with some of our later speakers, so we'll save the question um, and we'll hand it off to the uh, appropriate speaker. And hopefully, we can get an email back. With that, I'm going to hand it off to Scott Baker. Um, he's um, he's joining uh, from BJM, and, and Craig, I believe you're going to be presenting as well. So let me, I have your slides, so let me get those queued up for you, and give me one second to do that. Okay, can you can you hear me and can you see the slides? Sorry, I muted myself. Yes, we can hear you loud and clear and your slides are up. You should be able to see them as well, hopefully. Okay, great. And I'll let you draw, I'll let you, I'll tell you when to advance them. Um, yeah. Thank you all. Um, this, I'm Craig Glazer, the Vice President of Federal Government Policy for PJM Interconnection. I also want to introduce my colleague, Scott Baker. Here at PJM, we are. I'm going to probably have to um, uh, duck out right after this presentation, but Scott will be available then to continue the discussion. Um, um, first of all, I have to note that when I read the um, XM uh, initial roadmap for the energy transition, I thought I was reading a PJM document. Uh, it's many of the same issues, um, but I'm going to try today to not repeat. Uh, what my other colleagues, I shared some of the same concerns, but I want to focus more on the issue of capacity um, and how we deal with the um, uh, capacity needs of the system going forward. Um, I did have the opportunity some months ago to participate in a neighborhood partnership with uh, 
uh, Craig, the regulator in Columbia, and very much appreciated that. So I learned a fair amount about your system at that time. Um, what I think distinguishes PJM, if we could go to the first slide, is that we have a very large system. It's really one of the largest in the United States, if not the world. 165,000 megawatts of load, 180,000 megawatts of generation, um, and 84,000 miles of transmission. So we operate a very large system serving over uh, 60 million people, 65 million people in the United States. Um, next slide. We do, like any system operator, we are involved with reliability, markets, and of course, planning of the transmission grid. But if we could go to the next slide, from the inception, markets are really what PGM has been all about. So we run um, a real-time market, a day-ahead market uh, for energy. Day-ahead is creating the financial commitments and real-time is what's balancing the system uh, for any deviations between load and supply. We also run markets for ancillary services. And we have what's called a reliability pricing model, which is um, the actual capacity market that I'll mention a bit. We also have a market for long-term transmission rights. Those are all in blue. And you'll see towards the green end are a host of financial markets that work off of those markets. We don't operate those, um, but those obviously are uh, dependent on the price information coming out of our real-time and day-ahead dispatch. Um, I wanted to go to the next slide if we could, because again, our fuel mix is today very different than Columbia's in the sense that we really have a very diverse fuel mix today. We still have about 20% coal, 32% nuclear, 40% gas, and 6.8% of renewables of, um, and about within that, about 8,000 megawatts of hydro. So it's a very different profile and that diversity actually is extremely helpful to us, but that also creates a threat going forward because when we look at the interconnection queue of what is going in, what is being built, it is almost all renewables. No nuclear, very little gas, no coal. Uh, it is all renewable. So we are starting with sort of a more diverse base than I would say New York or California has been. But um, that's why I wanted to focus our challenges um, less on operations and frankly more on sort of capacity. Because if we could go to the next slide, we are seeing as a result of public policy here in the United States and public policy in our states, as well as economics units that are projected to retire, roughly about potential of by 2030 of losing 40 gigawatts, representing 21% of our current installed generation. And much of that, as you can see, is coal and natural gas that will be, and diesel to a certain extent, that will be retiring from the system. So the fundamental problem that we have is that the mass is not adding up. We are seeing a potential greater number of subtractions that are coming faster in our case than the addition of renewables. Again, I've still got a large base to manage the deviations today manage real-time operations today, but it's more sort of looking forward. So if we could actually skip the next slide and go to reserve market projections, we recently did an analysis looking at various projections, various study scenarios, including high new entry of renewables and low new entry of renewables, um, a different load forecast, but most of all, the impact of electrification of vehicles and heating load in, the, uh, in, in our region. And what we see is a very tightening of reserve margins, in some cases really below acceptable levels, down to 3% potentially um, um, by 2030, which certainly are unacceptable levels. So the next slide. 
is really just sort of summarizes what I just indicated. The, the math is not adding up. Uh, we are not getting one for one replacements. Interestingly, what we're finding is a lot of pressure on fossil units to retire. We are seeing lots of renewables in the queue, but we've seen a slowdown in the amount of renewables that are actually going into commercial operation. There's a couple of reasons for that. Obviously, there have been some delays in the queue itself in managing those, those, those uh, new interconnections. But even for those who have been through the interconnection queue, what we are seeing is uh, an inability to obtain off-taker agreements. We thought they might've had off-taker agreements, but facing now the economy in 2023, the off-taker agreements are not as lucrative as they were. So they're not developing. Other issues, we've got a major supply chain challenge here that has been uh, exacerbated by concern about um, solar panels coming in from China are being sort of um, um, really sort of uh, washed through, if you will. Uh, countries in Southeast Asia, and there's a major investigation and uh, curtailment of supplies as a result of that. So the usual market for supply chain is not what it was. We are looking as a policy matter in the United States to massively increase the amount of domestically built um, solar panels and uh, wind farm, wind, uh, wind turbines. But that is a function, frankly, of how much government support they get, as well as the economics, given that these can be built so much cheaper in other countries and imported to the United States. So there's a big push and pull. And until we straighten out what our import chain is going to look like for these inf this infrastructure, it's going to have a significant drag on the development of these renewables. You've had a lot of presentations today, so I'm gonna keep this short and I'm just gonna wrap up with, so what are we doing about it? Because there's one thing in the state problems, what the question is, what are we doing about it? A couple of features in PJM, one is we have a forward capacity market. Um, unlike New York and even California, ours is a three year forward commitment to, uh, of obtaining capacity. We as the, as the system operator are purchasing capacity on behalf of all of the customers based on a forecast of demand three years from now. So that gives us a level of certainty going in as to what we're going to have from a reliability perspective. It's not foolproof for a bunch of reasons, but if a unit retires in the mid before the delivery year, the third year, then they have to basically buy out of their position and substitute capacity for what they're achieving. So the forward capacity market is a very important tool. I don't know what Columbia has in that, but it's a very important tool in, in providing a revenue stream for the resources that you'll need for reliability. They may not run very much, but the fossil units that frankly we're going to need to balance the system when the renewables are not available. A second aspect is what we call ELCC, effective load carrying capability. Effective load carrying capability. Basically that is looking at, and it really comes out of the situation in California, looking at valuing or devaluing the capacity value of renewables based on the fact that adding additional renewables is not necessarily helping you to meet your needs. That at some point there's a diminished value as you saw in California in the middle of the day, for example, of adding renewables. So ELCC, as we determine how much we have to buy three years forward, ELCC calculation takes that into effect, into account. We are looking to get away from the concept of a single peak demand and going now to an analysis of reliability risks both summer and winter, which is a very different focus and one particularly important given renewables. We are also looking at a reserve product in addition to capacity or capacity market to help us deal with having adequate reserves, you know, at the time when the sun is not available and the wind is not available. And finally, behind the meter generation, we have seen lots of people putting solar panels on homes and businesses. 
Key to that is visibility and dispatchability of those resources. Um, the, um, I can't stress enough to build that into your regulatory rules up front because we are trying to sort of do a bit of a patchwork here in the US. We've got a very divided regulatory framework between states and the federal government, but dealing with that issue and ensuring that you have uh, visibility and dispatchability could make these behind the meter resources very, very helpful to managing the, the load on the system. But if you don't know about them, if you don't know how they're being used, they are not particularly helpful and can actually be harmful. You're a bit flying blind, if you will, as to what's truly available on the system. So with that, I'm going to close at this point and um, turn it over to my, my colleagues here for question and answers. Uh, but I very much appreciate and hope we PGM can, can continue to be a resource to you all. And my thanks to USEA for organizing this. Thank you. Thank you, Craig. We really appreciate your comments. Um, I know we're running behind. With that, we will be ending the webinar. As I mentioned in the chat, you can reach me at plorenz at usca.org with any questions for our, our speakers. And we certainly do appreciate you spending time with us today, as well as thank you to our guests from uh, New York ISO, Kaiso here in person, and obviously PJM, who just got just uh, discussed. Many thanks to them. We will be closing the session and moving to the next. Thank you very much. Goodbye.